God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, you from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily praise your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I confess to God Almighty, before the whole company of heaven, and to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that I have sinned exceedingly in the law, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty, and have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. The Almighty and merciful Lord give to you pardon, forgiveness, the washing away of all your sin. Amen. Dave is reading to us from the back of the bulletin, the words of Moses recounting the history of ancient Israel in the wilderness. From Numbers 11, 46, 10, 16, 24, and 29. Now the rabble that was among the children of Israel had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth, that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom, as a nurse carries a nursing child, to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get the meat to give all these people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, who you know to be the elders of the people and the officers over them, and bring them to the tent meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remain in the camp, one named El Eldad, the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in camp. And the young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, and Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from this from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In continuing our reading in the James letter, this one read by Carolyn. 
Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave him rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that you, that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand honoring Jesus' words. The Holy Gospel is written by St. Mark in chapter 9. John, his disciple, said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame and with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Let's speak our faith as Jesus who salts our life. You've got the um, Apostle Creed on our way to I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was received by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in the air. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of seated friends. <clears throat> so this is the fourth week that we hear from James. And this has been unusual in my preaching, but I've stuck with him all the way through, haven't I? This James who uh, starts by talking about our hands, how they need to be active, sharing the love that Jesus put to our hearts. And then he talked about tongue, right? Untamable until Jesus teaches us how to praise and be a blessing to others. He goes from the hand to the tongue. Where did he go last week? He's working his way in. The heart, you know. 
if our heart is chasing after the world, you know, we're going to end up hating God. But the strange thing is, when we love God, he sets our hearts free, and now we learn how to love the world. So where does he go after that? You know, he's got what we do and what we say and even what we believe. What else can James say? He actually ends somewhere else. This is the last couple of paragraphs in James' epistle. So here's my clue. I realize not everybody can see this picture back there. I've got a picture of what here? Camel's legs. <clears throat> yeah, believe it or not, this is the uh, nickname of James, the eldest of Jesus' half brothers, the second born of Mary, first born of Mary and Joseph. There's a fellow named Gisippus, who a hundred years after James was stoned to death, he writes one of the very first histories of those early churches. And here's what he tells us about James. He says, James was often found kneeling, begging the forgiveness of God's people. And so the skin of his knees became calloused like a camel by constantly bending the knee in adoration of God and begging forgiveness for God's people. So James' nickname in the early church, this is not in scripture, but apparently his nickname was Camel Knees. <laughs> I don't want camel knees myself. But that was his mark. And that's where he goes, from the hand to the tongue to the heart to the knee. Look how this text starts. He says, is anyone suffering among you? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. See, Christians experience life much like anybody else, don't we? We have days when the, the sun is shining and we're cheerful. We got other days when we're in some dark valley, some shadow. And we don't like to be there. The difference is, when we are cheerful, like it was described of James, he bends the knee in adoration of Jesus. We can sing praise. We know where this joy comes from. And so we sing out to him. And the same, when we're suffering, again, we bend the knee begging Jesus for his care. We pray. And not just for ourselves, we say, Jesus, my brothers and sisters, they are in need. So if you look at James' gospel, it's kind of a, or his, his epistle, it's kind of an easy way to remember it. He goes from the hand sharing love to the tongue speaking love to the heart you know, beating with that love of Jesus. But finally, he says, you've got to be connected with the source of love. You've got to remember your knees. You've got to be on knee listening to the word of Jesus. And so whispering back to him in your prayer. It's on bent knee that we see, my brothers, my sisters, that the Lord lives and he forgives. So to just walk through this text, he says in verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Now Jesus has already told, uh, James has already told us when we're suffering to pray, but he says something more here. He says, when you're sick, what else do you do? You don't just yourself pray, what else do you do? Yeah, you call others. The thing about sickness, or really any kind of trouble, is the enemy loves to isolate us. You know? He wants to get you off by yourself, because we're a lot easier to pick off one by one. So James insists, call for the elders. If you're sick, ask for prayers from your brothers and sisters. Jesus gave you a faith family. Call for the elders of the church, even from your sick bed. I've often had that happen in my ministry, of course. And then, you know, sometimes people, people get sick and, and they say, oh, it's not that bad, or I don't want to bother Pastor, or now it's too bad, you know. What can anybody do? So I'm also very grateful not only when somebody's hurting and they call me, or they call another Christian friend of the side. It's great if you see somebody else, you know, in the hospital or in need. You know, for heaven's sakes, let, let the church leadership know. Well, that's a practical thing there. Change is always very practical in this gospel. Call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, James says. You can almost see these others that come. And, you know, maybe you've done that yourself, somebody in sickbed, and you kind of gather hands, and you're literally over them in your prayer. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 
So about every six weeks or so, and Courtney, we've been having these uh, Wednesdays of prayer and service. And um, we actually got one a week from Wednesday. And sometimes we use a little oil. Very common in the Lutheran tradition in Europe, but it wasn't really much practiced here in the States. And so more recently now, uh, a personal prayer is an opportunity at that Wednesday service. You know, for somebody to pray for you one-on-one -on -one or a small group to pray for your need or a need of some other loved one. And if you want to receive just this little dot of oil with the sign of the cross that says, you know, receive this oil as a sign. It's a symbol, a reminder of Jesus' healing and forgiveness. So what is James saying? We should uh, use the anointing oil and forget the medicine? I really don't think so. You know, when you look at the, at the scripture as a whole, oil often, you know, for hundreds of years had been the best medicine. Remember Psalm 23? What does the good shepherd do for the sheep who has wandered into the thorn bush and is all cut up? You anoint my head with oil, right? Or think of the good Samaritan story that, that Jesus tells. This fellow is beat up on the side of the road and finally the Samaritan, this alien comes by and he picks the guy up and he, and how does he dress his wounds? With oil. <coughs> Washes them out with water and, yeah, exactly, right? He, he puts oil, the soothing oil, you know? It's not, you've had a sunburn, you know? It feels good, right? So oil, in fact, was the best medicine of James' day. He's not discouraging us from using the best medicine. Neither is he discouraging us from using, you know, oil in, in anointment with our prayer. He's certainly not discouraging us from praying, but James says with all this stuff, he says... Let them pray over anointing with oil in the name of the <coughs> Lord. I mean, any doctor worth of salt will tell you, you know, I can apply medicine, but I can't heal. Any, any pastor or any leader of the church will tell you, we can pray for you, but we can't heal. Right? These things are people and tools through which God works. It's the living Lord Jesus who wants to bring us to that fullness of life. This is why prayer is so precious, because it's an opportunity to, to see that, that problem that just seems to be weighing us down so, you know, it's just overwhelming, but to let it go out of our hands and to put it into his hands, <laughs> his nail-pierced hands. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let these elders pray over him, anointing the sick one with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer. Now, this struck me as strange. Whose prayer? Who's been praying here? Yeah, the, the elders. These righteous people that he's called to his side. James isn't denying that your own prayer will be.